So, uh, welcome and thank you for participating in this evening's program on the centenary of the Armenian Genocide. I'm Huri Berberian, Professor of Middle Eastern History and Director of the Middle Eastern Studies Program. Uh, I would like to start off by thanking a few people and entities uh, before we begin, uh, especially the College of Liberal Arts Scholarly Intersections Grant and our co-sponsors, the Departments of History, Political Science, as well as uh, International Studies Program for making tonight possible. Uh, and before I introduce the speakers and say a few words myself, uh, I would like to also thank Provost Dave Dowell and Dean Wallace uh, for, thank you, for water. And I'd like to thank Dr. Eman for the water bottles. Um, I'd like to thank Provost Dowell and uh, Dean Wallace for being here. And uh, I invite them to give a few remarks. And um, if we can start with Provost Dowell, uh, please give him a warm welcome. <laughs> Well, thank you. This, this is such an important event. Um, I'd like to begin by thanking our speakers, um, Mr. Guchek and, um, and um, La Baridran. I'm not sure if I did those names uh, correctly, but um, very grateful to them, uh, distinguished individuals. Uh, and I'm sure that we're going to have a very important and interesting um, event about this uh, amazing anniversary, 100 years. Uh, it's an amazing moment to be thinking about this. Uh, both of these are founding members of the organizing committee of the workshop for Armenian Turkish Scholarship, which is an ongoing effort on the part of a number of scholars, Armenian, Turkish, and other, to investigate the causes and the circumstances and the consequences of the Armenian Genocide of 1915 and to overcome the politics of recognition and denial. And today they will discuss the politics of recognition and denial of the Armenian Genocide, which began in April 19 and 15, 100 years ago, and caused the deaths of more than a million Ottoman Armenians. Uh, so this is such a significant time. Uh, I also want to thank Professor Barbarian for her efforts to bring these speakers to campus and to acknowledge the Middle Eastern Studies Program and the Departments of History and Political Science and International Studies for their role in making this possible. And uh, many years ago, I was telling one of our speakers, uh, probably 30 years ago now, I happened across a book in the library. I, I used to do that, just randomly pull a book from a shelf, and it was an account. I was trying to ask him to help me to remember the title of the book. Maybe one of you will know. Uh, it was an account by a diplomat of traveling in the region where these events happened um, a few years. I, I was thinking it was a year after, but it might have been two or three years after that. And so it was essentially a firsthand report of evidence of things that had transpired. And at the time I read this book, I was much younger. <laughs> my hair was not so gray. And it was my very first exposure to even the thought that that had occurred previously. It had not appeared anywhere in my education. But um, I'm particularly moved by being here tonight because uh, that reading that book has has long uh, stuck with me, and um, and as a psychologist, I was uh, it spurred a little bit of my interest in trying to understand how human beings can do some of the things that they do, and the many instances of of things like that that have happened throughout the history. Um, and as I was reminding myself a little bit about this and googling this. Uh, uh, recently, I, I discovered that at Yerevan in Armenia, overlooking the Ararat Valley, um, there's a memorial to those who died on April 24th, 100 years ago this month, uh, and in the subsequent violence that occurred after that. Uh, and in that memorial burns an eternal flame to help us to not forget what happened. But it also features a stella that symbolizes the rebirth of the Armenian people. And to me, that seems quite appropriate. And while this, as I'm sure most or all of us know, uh, this topic can be controversial in some circles, uh, I am pleased that we operate in an environment where civility of discourse characterizes the way we will speak about these things. And so I'm completely confident that tonight we will have a, an informed, uh, an intellectual, uh, and a civil discussion of the topic at hand. So thank you all for being here. I'm very pleased that we have such a good crowd and this is a uh, not well enough known but a remarkably important um, topic in history. So thank you for the opportunity to share a few thoughts with you. More volume. 
Very I'm sure we can. <laughs> I think it is related to this. Is it better? Yeah. Yeah, I think you just need to lean. Yeah. So until we figure it out. Yeah. Right. Okay. Okay, I'll work on it while our speakers are speaking. <laughs> um, thank you, Provost Al. Uh, our, uh, for another uh, set of opening remarks. Uh, I invite uh, Dean Wallace. Please give him a warm welcome. One of the things I just can't get used to as a dean is sometimes people applaud when all I've done is walked up to a microphone. <laughs> that was my fault. Yeah. <laughs> yes, I guess I. Uh, I also want to thank uh, Dr. Barbarian, and I think we should give her. I think we should give her a hand for all of her work in bringing this off. All right, I'm just going to uh, pretend this is an ice cream cone. <laughs> I, was, uh, I did a lot of thinking about verbs tonight. Normally, when I come to these sorts of events, I say how happy I am to see folks, how pleased I am. But somehow, those verbs don't seem right tonight, and usually, when you think about an anniversary, you think about celebration, which certainly is not appropriate, and even commemoration of the loss of hundreds of thousands of people doesn't seem quite right. And so I think here tonight that we're here to mark this occurrence, this important occurrence in history, to remember the people who were lost and also to learn a bit more. Like Provost Dow, my education taught me almost nothing about this, uh, about this very sad chapter in our history. So I'm very pleased to be here with you tonight, although I won't say I'm happy about this occasion. And I also want to thank our panelists, and I look forward to learning a lot more this evening. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Dean Wallace. So before I begin to uh, say a few words myself and introduce our speakers, uh, I would like to plug uh, the uh, event that's happening in the University Student Union Ballroom, uh, 100 Years of Genocide, on April 14th, Tuesday, this coming Tuesday, between 6 to 8. There will be a documentary, Watchers of the Sky, as well as a uh, couple of speakers and a panel discussion. <laughs> okay, so I will leave this up here. Uh, if you'd like to look at it uh, after uh, the program, you're welcome to. You got it? I think it's louder now. Is this Try better? <laughs> I'm trying. Okay, well, I think we should go on. Okay. All right. Okay, I would like to say a few words to place things in context. I promise to be very brief for those who are less than familiar with the Armenian Genocide. So April 24th, uh, as was mentioned earlier, 1915, marks the symbolic start of the Armenian Genocide when several hundred Armenian intellectuals, leading Armenian intellectuals of Istanbul, uh, the capital of the Ottoman Empire at the time, were rounded up, deported, and killed, thus decapitating uh, a people in some sense. Between April 1915 uh, and 1918, and some say even 1922, 800,000, between 800,000 and one and a half million Armenians in the Ottoman Empire, particularly in the, uh, what is today Eastern Turkey, were sent to their deaths in organized mass killings, deprivation, and deportations to the Syrian and Iraqi deserts. The perpetrators included government forces, but also local populations of Turks and Kurds. But it is also important to note that many Turks and Kurds helped hide and protect Armenians without whose help they would, not, they would have certainly met their deaths. The Armenian Genocide is arguably the first uh, of the 20th century and unfortunately a precedent to others. It has led to the birth of today's Armenian diaspora, a global uh, widespread diaspora all over uh, all corners of uh, the earth. It has become pivotal to defining modern national identities to both descendants of the perpetrators 
that is modern Turks, and descendants of the victims, that is modern Armenians. And it has served as a central defining element in the Armenian identity and consciousness hardened by continued denial by successive Turkish states. So it is uh, my honor uh, tonight uh, truly to introduce our speakers, uh, whom I consider not only colleagues but friends, um, who will each speak for 10 minutes. Uh, they didn't want to speak longer. Uh, that in itself says something about academics, uh, that they're different. <laughs> Uh, and uh, afterwards, uh, I might, depending on uh, what they uh, said, I might ask them a few questions or just open up the, uh, the uh, floor uh, for your questions, uh, which uh, I welcome perhaps if you walk down the stairs so you could be heard. Uh, so we will start with uh, Gerard Libaridian, uh, who was for 11 years the Alex Manugian Professor of Modern Armenian History at the University of Michigan Ann Arbor until his retirement in 2012, but he hasn't actually retired, in my opinion. Uh, from 1993 to 1997, Professor Libaridian served as advisor to the first president of the Independent Republic of Armenia, and later as first deputy minister of foreign affairs. Uh, he has authored and edited a number of books, including Modern Armenia, People, Nation, State. Fatma Mugegecek is Professor of Sociology and Women's Studies at the University of Michigan, Ann Arbor. She has authored and edited a number of books. Most recently, she authored Denial of Violence, Ottoman Past, Turkish Present, and Collective Violence Against the Armenian, 1789 to 2009. And this was published in 2014, just last, last year. So Provost Dahl mentioned their participation, that the fact that they were founding members of Watts, so I won't go into it. But I will say that they have been at the forefront of open discussion about the Armenian genocide uh, in the face of continued denial by the Turkish state, but also in the face of increasing openness on the part of a growing uh, number of Turks. So uh, I, without uh, further ado, please give them a very warm welcome. And we'll start with uh, Professor Libaridian. Thank you very much, Huri. Um, Thank you, uh, Provost Dave and Dean Dave, for joining us on this occasion. I am. Can I make it closer to you? <clears throat> Do whatever you want. <laughs> I think that's better. I've survived much worse. <laughs> um, it's a pleasure being here. Um, I am a product of the Cal State system. Cal State Los Angeles uh, too many years ago, uh, where I had a great education. And um, uh, it was there that uh, for the first time I heard an academic speak of the genocide, and that was Professor Daniel Chrysilius uh, from Princeton. Uh, before that, all we had heard was our family stories, newspapers, our grandfathers, grandmothers telling us the stories. And uh, to hear it in an academic environment was, uh, was a uh, very, very moving, at the same time, challenging experience. Um, I'll be talking 10 minutes. It's much more difficult than talking for an hour, believe me. Uh, so I have written down some notes, which I want to share with you, hoping that at the end they'll make some sense. Uh, first, uh, let me say that um, I personally am not willing to discuss uh, the, the question whether this was genocide or not. Uh, we are far past beyond that. Um, there are uh, reasons why that happens, and I'll discuss it briefly. But um, I don't think it's the proper time to do uh, that kind of discussion. Uh, secondly, uh, I personally am too old to find any joy or satisfaction in uh, any president, prime minister, uh, declaring that this was genocide. I'm far past beyond that. It doesn't give me any joy. And it even feels sometimes insulting that uh, 
others uh, will have to say this was genocide. We know what it was. Um, and I also don't expect everyone in this room to agree with me. Uh, but um, my intention here is to raise some issues on why denial and why recognition. Uh, that is, what does that mean? And hopefully, uh, we can uh, overall go beyond the discussion of uh, what is the job of historians and sociologists and others, uh, the majority of whom agree on what happened. Now, there are some people who do not know, and that's why they, they don't agree with this position. There are some people who feel uncomfortable agreeing with this position. The genocide was committed during the Ottoman Empire, and then uh, the central part of it became the Republic of Turkey since 1923. But as my colleague Professor Gercek and others have demonstrated, there has been a there was a continuity of the personnel involved in both. So at the foundations of the Republic. There is this sense that we cannot accept that this is genocide. There is the concept of the, the way history was taught in Turkey since then, and that is the um, immaculate birth theory, that nothing bad happened. All that happened was Turks fought against imperialists, which was true, uh, or Muslims did, and they, they became uh, independent, and that's all there is to it. Now, if you put a genocide underneath that, it becomes quite problematic. There's a question of, on a personal level, Turkish citizens feeling uncomfortable accepting uh, what happened to be of the calamity that the term genocide implies. I had uh, a conversation with a Turkish foreign minister official just last month who said, that even if the Turkish government recognizes this as genocide, she would never do it, because that might imply that her grandfather might have been a criminal. But that is resolving a very personal problem, not resolving the problem of what happened in history and what the consequences were. Uh, it is worth mentioning that in, in the uh, ideology of the Turkish state, uh, genocide and recognition of genocide means giving legitimacy uh, to Armenian uh, issues during the Ottoman Empire. And it's uh, that Turkish policy is based, or Ottoman, including Ottoman, was based on uh, the necessary protection of the territorial integrity of the empire. And anything that undermines that uh, is a threat to national security. So it's in this context that it becomes very difficult for many people to recognize uh, what happened as genocide. Now, there have been attempts on the part of uh, uh, recent uh, officials of the recent government in Turkey to equate what happened to Armenians with what happened to Muslims. That is, it was war, people suffered, uh, except that there, there's a fundamental difference. That what happened to Armenians was organized by the state, and um, uh, the result is that most Muslims survived and they created a Turkish state today, while Armenians uh, were by and large gone from their, what was their uh, historic homeland of uh, thousands of years. So there's a, a very, very fundamental difference uh, this was not civil war, this was not, although some people killed each other, but fundamentally, uh, uh, you can't overcome by creating uh, false equivalences. Now, um, I will, uh, the second part of my presentation will be on what it means for Armenians. To begin with, Armenians in the diaspora especially, but also in Armenia, um, have clung to the term genocide, which has a very specific meaning, as opposed to simple massacres, 
uh, and deportations or ethnic cleansing. The term genocide involves intentionality, the intention to exterminate a people or parts of it. This intentionality brings in official government policy, and this is uh, very important. Armenians, uh, the term didn't exist, the genocide, the term genocide in English or in Armenian didn't exist. It was used extermination of peoples, etc. 1948, it was created and it stuck. And most scholars who have studied this have concluded that the UN Convention on uh, Prevention and Punishment of Genocide, the way it defines, corresponds to, or what happened to Armenians corresponds to that definition. Now, Honest people may disagree, but by and large, it's been very difficult to get away from there. But for Armenians to accept anything less than that, having lost over a million people, having lost their homeland, having lost all their properties, uh, to accept anything less than that is like uh, uh, being killed a second time. And the non-recognition uh, becomes very hurtful. But it, but also being absorbed by this genocide issue, the memory of it, and the hurt that comes with denial, has become also very paralyzing to Armenians community-wise, intellectually, and in terms of creativity. It is as if there's something there beyond which you cannot go. So you become a prisoner of your own past, a prisoner of uh, the policies of another government. The genocide in, since the 1980s has become a principle of community organization. That is uh, often what, it bring, what brings Armenians together. It has become an integral and prominent element of Armenian identity. It has also become a principle of legitimation of power within the community. That is, if you want to be a leader in the community, uh, you talk about genocide and you talk about denial of genocide and all the implications, and that's what makes you a leader. That's what makes you a super patriot. And this is not the best of thing that could happen to Armenians. Um, it has also had some limiting impact on discourse, political discourse among Armenians. That is, uh, we have now an orthodoxy to which you must follow. And if you don't follow that orthodoxy on the genocide, uh, then uh, you are not a good Armenian. And you may be a threat to Armenian security. So this has created a limiting impact on uh, what should be more of a democratic process that is ideas, counter ideas, disagreements, and be, uh, all of which should produce a much more uh, vibrant and, and self-conscious and self-critical um, society. By and large though, um, what we are looking at today is a very asymmetric warfare. I'm not talking, and we don't have time to talk about uh, relations between Turkey as a state and Armenia as a state. That's a different level, it's a different issue, although some overlap exists, of course. I'm talking about a diaspora that's all over the world, for whom the genocide has become number one item on the agenda, and they're all over the place. And there are different parties, different churches, different organizations, youth groups, cultural groups, artistic groups. And each one has its own idea. On some things they agree, on other things they don't agree. And here's the Turkish state trying to convince Armenians in the diaspora not to pay too much attention to the genocide and to become friends again. Who are they going to talk to? This conflict will continue. Uh, but fortunately, we have had major changes. Uh, on the Armenian side, the change has been that we have um, moved away from uh, thinking of Turkey and Turks as genocidal by essence. We have to move away, and a lot of us have moved away, not all of us. It's essential to think 
of these events as historical events and to understand the historical framework, which then makes it possible to talk with Turks and Turkey today and to see whether we can understand the science of it and the terminology. On the Turkish side, we have now a great movement of Turkish citizens who think the issue of the genocide and what happens to happen to Armenians and to others is essential to democratize Turkey, to get away from the Turkish monolithic, Turkish state monolithic, in, monolithic interpretation of history. That if you don't confront these things and you accept history that is dictated by state ideology and security ideology, then uh, you cannot be a democratic society because you have too many taboos. You cannot discuss the Armenian issue, the Kurdish issue, the uh, Yazdi issue, and the Alevi issue, and uh, the issues of democratization, the role of the military in Turkey, and the role of state ideology that is imposed. And everything that is done in the name of the state is justified. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much, Professor Libaridian. Uh, and now uh, I invite uh, Professor Gucek uh, to uh, give her remarks. Please uh, welcome her. Thank you, uh, thank you very much, um, Uri, uh, dear friend and colleague, as well as uh, uh, the university uh, for having me here. Uh, I've not been here before, uh, but since I live in Ann Arbor, Michigan, I'm perpetually jealous of your weather. <laughs> well, that goes without saying, uh, which is wonderful, uh, and it's great uh, to be here in this context. Uh, I also forgot, uh, but Jerry Liberidian and I, not only are we colleagues that go back a long way, but uh, we also taught a course together, the first course ever. Uh, in the history of the world uh, on Turkish-Armenian relations taught by a Turk and an Armenian together. So that is, I think, important, uh, especially in terms of uh, creating uh, a joint, a common past of, of what happened. Um, I decided uh, to talk for the, the 10 minutes allocated to me uh, on how I came to write the book I did on the denial of violence and also maybe therefore give you a perspective of sort of the changes that Jireyer mentions uh, that are going on in Turkey uh, of the new generation uh, that are uh, not only uh, willing but insistent on uh, acknowledging uh, the Armenian genocide. Um, and as a, cons I mean, as a part of that, as uh, Jireyer also mentioned, uh, democratization is uh, extremely important in this endeavor. Um, after I got tenure um, at Michigan and I was thinking of, of, of writing um, another book, uh, I actually wanted to initially uh, write a book on the Islamic movement in Turkey when I started working on this, uh, uh, on the second book project in the 1990s. At the time, I would go to Turkey and interview a lot of the, the Islamist uh, leaders, uh, but the 90s were marked by a, a number of coups, military coups, that went on uh, and you know, uh, contained the Islamist movement, so to speak, one after another. Um, so whenever I came and talked about my work in the States, they said, great that you're trying to figure out how things are working in, in Turkey. But rather than talking to the Islamists, you should go and talk to the military instead, because they are obviously holding the keys to what's going on in Turkey. There are very few people who have done so and still survive to this day. I decided that was not um, a, you know, a path I was going to go down uh, uh, it, because it was so dangerous. So what question I did have, however, was I wondered why was it that Turkish uh, society was so willing, so willing to accept this political violence of, of coups, I mean, and why they were so welcoming of, of uh, uh, authoritarianism, so to speak, you know, in, in rule. And as a consequence, uh, I also then wondered, why was violence so normalized and naturalized into Turkish society in a way to justify, basically, such uh, uh, authoritarian rule? 
And I deducted from there that there must have been a foundational violence for which uh, neither the Turkish state nor the Turkish society had ever accounted and were punished for. So this is how I started going back in history, trying to figure out where such a foundational violence could be located. And that took me to 1915, 1917, uh, to the genocide. Um, and uh, as a consequence of then uh, what happened, uh, I wrote uh, the book I did. Uh, it took me about uh, 12 years to write the book. Uh, uh, because this was such a politicized uh, topic. Uh, there was a lot of reaction uh, from both sides, uh, which is interesting. Uh, but both sides claimed that I was Armenian, which was also interesting. Uh, they agreed, actually, on, on, on, on who I was. Uh, uh, why? Because the Armenians, when I talked on these issues, said that I could not be a Turk because Turk could never, a Turk could never talk on these things the way I did. So I must have some Armenian blood in me that got in me somehow to sort of make me more civilized and inclined to so, so such things. The Turks made the same argument. They said, there's something wrong with my blood, obviously, because no ethnic Turk in her right mind uh, would say these things. So obviously I was tainted one way or the other. They didn't know how. And it was certain that I was an Armenian, therefore. So it was fascinating to see uh, this and uh, the politicization uh, that occurred when I started uh, working on it. But nevertheless, I want to emphasize the book itself is a very long book, 644 pages. So uh, I'm glad it's out of me. I don't know who will have the patience to read it, but hey, I got it out there, so that's uh, what counts. What's very important for me is, however, uh, the main message uh, of the book. The book says, basically argues that uh, the collective violence against the Armenians was a long process that started much earlier. Uh, and it continues up to this day. And it tries to demonstrate how the denial of the violence that was committed has been layered out through history and that it gives basically a, a, a narrative of that layering. What is most important for me, however, and why I took up uh, this project is uh, the emotional meaning of, of 1915, uh, of, of, of, uh, of the genocide for both not only for the Armenians, uh, but for the, the Turks as well. And of course, Jair being very insightful already talked about all this uh, in another way, but I'll give you my version that these great minds think alike, right? <laughs> <laughs> well, what is fascinating with respect to uh, Armenians is that uh, whenever I talk to them, uh, they talk about 1915 as if it happened yesterday. I mean, it is that close, and that, uh, and they feel the emotions uh, that much. And this is the case uh, we know from uh, social science studies uh, with all open wounds. Wounds uh, cannot heal if there is not acknowledgement, uh, uh, proper acknowledgement from the perpetrator. And this is why I think uh, uh, the wounds have been there, uh, and that is uh, extremely destructive, not only, of course, for the first generation that actually experienced the violence, but also for the succeeding generations that have inherited it, because it is like inheriting uh, these negative emotions like a black hole, uh, and with it, unfortunately, uh, the pessimism uh, uh, uh, of loss of trust in humanity, because the, here, is a, here is a violence, here is a destruction that has not been acknowledged. And that lack of acknowledgement, uh, the perpetration of violence, they say denial is the last stage of, uh, of genocide, that perpetration of that violence makes one no longer trust that humanity uh, has any purpose, that it could be uh, just, uh, because they obviously have inherited and seen an unjust world. 
uh, an injustice which is extremely uh, difficult to live with. Uh, and that is why I think they are trapped in 1915 and cannot move emotionally beyond it because of the nature of this. And one thing I always do whenever I talk about this uh, is uh, I uh, want to apologize. I apologize as an ethnic Turk, as a scholar, um, as a Turkish citizen, uh, to all Armenians and their descendants uh, for the, the pain and suffering that my ancestors caused. I am sorry. Uh, I am not guilty, but I am responsible. And my responsibility is an ethical one. Uh, I apologize for all that pain and suffering that has gone acknowledged. And that is, uh, I think, uh, an important thing. I said I am not guilty, but responsible, because I obviously did not personally do anything uh, to the Armenians. But nevertheless, I live in a society, and I am a member of a society that has perpetrated uh, this violence, and as a consequence, I have to come to term with that. And the f way I have come to term with it is by uh, deciding to work on this and to, to demonstrate at least uh, to the world uh, what had happened uh, and uh, how it happened. And that's what my book is about. That is important uh, from the perspective you know, of, of sort of what the toll has been on the Armenians. But there is also a very significant toll on the Turks as well. Perpetrators, too, are uh, negatively impacted by what happened because they were able to get away with a violence for which not only did they have to, uh, were they uh, not punished, but in the case of many of the perpetrators who then became the leaders of the Turkish Republic, they were actually uh, rewarded. Uh, we have among the perpetrators, uh, for example, uh, two uh, very prominent uh, presidents who are also prime ministers. Uh, Ismet İnönü, who was the president of Turkey, had been also uh, the uh, informal leader of uh, the Tashkilatu Mahsusa. Uh, which is the special organization, uh, the, the special paramilitary organization that massacred uh, many of the Armenians. Um, likewise, Celal Bayar, who was the president after him, uh, and the prime minister as well, likewise uh, um, was a member of the same special organizations. These are things that are not known in history, uh, in Turkish history especially, and we do not know of the violence uh, of these men, because to Turks, they are Republican heroes. They whitewashed their past once they became leaders of the Republic. And unfortunately, uh, as a consequence, they are the ones who then also uh, used the same violence on other groups in Turkey. And as a consequence, uh, are a, a great detriment uh, to um, the possible democratization in Turkey, which is why, of course, I uh, took uh, the stand I did uh, to study and also, you know, uh, in a way highlight and, and articulate all, all this violence. What happens to the Turks, however, is that because they were able to get away with this violence, they also lost their trust in humanity from the other direction. Uh, in a way that they think the world, is, the world is not a just world, and you can do whatever you want to do in this world with sheer violence. And as a consequence, uh, they have lost their moral compass and trust in humanity as well in yet another way. That is why I think, uh, at least from my perspective, it is just as important and significant uh, for the Turks uh, to, uh, to acknowledge uh, this violence in, in, in, in their uh, term, as it is, of course, uh, very important uh, for the Armenians in order to start that healing process, hopefully together. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Gucek, uh, and again, Professor Libaridian. Um, <laughs> okay. Okay. Um, I would, uh, instead of uh, 
doing the questioning myself, uh, which I had planned to do, uh, but I think it might be better just to go straight to the audience. If you have questions, uh, please raise your hand. <clears throat> yes, please. I'm Lucine Huckabee. I'm a descendant of the genocide. My mom was three years old. Uh, I really appreciated what you had to say. I appreciated both of your presentation. Just to give you one example, we have in our college a wonderful department chair who's a Turk. One time we were alone and she said, Lucy, I'm sorry. Mm -hmm. And I didn't know where he was coming from. I said, what are you talking about? And he said, our history. Mm -hmm. And I said, I gave his name and I said, you know, I was not there, you were not there. We need to, f you don't forget, but you need to forgive and move on. Uh, do you foresee that the Turkish government will ever acknowledge? Well, should I just go? go? Yeah. If people can hear you. Yeah. You're fine. You're fine. Thank you. That's a wonderful question, and I'm sure we have a say on it, the government side, too, because I am uh, I am much more oh, the tape, the tape. I'm much more uh, interested, uh, of course, on the side of the civil society uh, than the government. Governments uh, and states are without hearts. Uh, they always put their own real interests before everything else. And I think what the Turkish government uh, and state, what they're trying to do at this point is to delay the acknowledgement as much as they can because. The more they delay it, the cheaper or the less costly it will be, they think, to the state, our states, or its governments. So that, uh, and I do not uh, deal with the government, you know, it does. <laughs> uh, what I'm most interested in is getting Turkish civil society uh, to exert pressure on what is going on. Because I think uh, there is definitely, uh, in the last 10 to 20 years, a lot of developments within Turkish civil society that uh, more and more people, especially younger generations, are much more willing uh, to acknowledge what has happened. And I think there will come a time when they will be able to exert a lot of pressure on the state itself. And that is the way to do it. It's very similar if you look uh, about, you know, into our own history here. Uh, about gay marriage, the violence against African Americans, all of these things are on the agenda uh, and, and I think will lead to positive results because the younger generations are much more conscientious about them. Yes, I'll leave there. Well, I, I would emphasize a point uh, Professor Gocek made, that is, <clears throat> uh, there's been quite a bit of change. That is, uh, until some years ago, if you printed an article or a book that used the term genocide with regard to Armenians, uh, you'd end up in, in, in a court, uh, if not in prison. That's not happening anymore. There's quite a bit of change. Uh, civil society, scholars, intellectuals, journalists uh, have uh, taken on themselves to, to say, you know, this is what happened. And uh, the government itself, I think, is uh, trying to come to terms with it. It has a, uh, the prime minister, who's now the president, made some kind of a statement last year, uh, which uh, Professor Gocek proved it was not an apology, uh, but it was mentioning that Armenians uh, had some reason to have felt pain, and you know, which is a, a step forward, and it is possible that over a period of time uh, the issue will become less um, uh, painful to recognize. Now, the other side of this is that one reason why some elements, at least uh, some elements in the Turkish establishment, do not um, feel like recognizing this thing as genocide is because of two consequences. One is the legal consequences. 
-huh. Genocide is a legal uh, international crime. So if you committed it, then are there consequences to this according to international law? Uh, the other thing is that for many Armenians, particularly the organized Armenian political parties, the recognition of the genocide is not just an act of historical justice, uh, but it is also the, pri the, the basis on the uh, the, the foundation on the basis of which there will be demands from Turkey, and those demands may be not just financial and properties and whatever, but also territorial. Now, the likelihood that Armenia or Armenians can take territory from Turkey is just about nil. But that you could demand it and demand it and make it an issue if the genocide is recognized, uh, this scares uh, some elements, and that makes it a little more difficult. Um, now, of course, that at the end it will depend on whether Turkish society evolves um, uh, evolves uh, deeply enough in order to for a government to come and say something different than what they've done before. Probably a decade to two decades is what I'm giving at the moment, <laughs> but who knows? Other questions? Really? Hey. <laughs> I, want to, I want to thank both speakers for really fascinating and interesting talks. And I want to ask both, what struck me about both of your talks is both of them are really directed to looking at how the effects of this violence 100 years ago echoed the present yeah. and continue to play such a powerful role in both the descendants of the victims and the descendants of the victims. I you know lots of people have the illusion that somehow there's a traumatic event and then people get over trauma and magically and it just goes away. We're looking at third and fourth generation survivors and descendants. And I'm, as both of you look at your work in trying to trace out the effects of this violence to the present, I'm wondering to what extent do you ever look at it in a comparative fashion at other genocides, whether the murder of the Jews, the murder of the Roma, uh, Rwanda, uh, Bosnia, and to look at, now those are obviously more recent, um, to see how those, the descendants of the perpetrators, descendants of the victims, <coughs> work through the trauma of that experience. Well, it's even more uh, traumatic. Uh, I have, of course, uh, looked at comparatively uh, other genocides, but uh, what is important here, for me at least, my major uh, question was, denial of, of, of violence, because that is going yet another step. So I would therefore look at uh, societies and um, states like Japan or China and others who denied what they did, because to me that was much more uh, traumatic and I couldn't understand why Turkish state and society denied it. Uh, so yes, of course, this is a human uh, condition, unfortunately, violence is. Uh, I think that with modernity, with nationalism, the scale uh, becomes extremely uh, higher and wider uh, and more destructive, of course, with uh, technology as well. But what interests me is how then uh, societies especially can live with themselves, knowing what had happened, or in this case, having collective am amnesia, in the Turkish case, uh, of, of what happened. To me, that was interesting, and I think what is crucial is something that uh, Professor Liveridan also alluded to. That is uh, education. The educational system in Turkey was not only centralized, they whitewashed the past. And all the, uh, all the violent pasts of all the Turkish Republican leaders. So for Turkey, in addition to acknowledging, which will bring a lot of, of course, uh, uh, issues with respect to restitution, reparation and such, it's also difficult uh, in terms of uh, uh, rewriting Republican history in, in a way that means that everyone uh, who claimed that the Republic was built with their own blood, sweat, and tears now has to admit it was built on the blood, sweat, and tears of Armenians. And that is not going to be an easy, easy task. I have not. Uh, studied in depth uh, the other cases. Uh, I've done some studies 
for my own education. And um, what I have followed uh, is a particular question in my mind. What is the role of uh, the experience and memory of genocide in government policies? Uh, I've done that more than, uh, let's say, what happens to societies. I think others have done that and are doing it. Um, if you look at the German government, uh, it's kind of uh, somewhat compelled, but they were quite happy uh, not to be so militaristic for a long time. And now they're debating whether to have a stronger military. Um, the, if you look at Israeli policy, you see that uh, the Holocaust is at the center of the discourse anyway, and uh, security formulations. In the Armenian case, there's an interesting uh, situation. It's uh, genocide happened in Western Armenia for the most part, in what was part of the Ottoman Armenia, historically Western Armenia. The Eastern part was uh, Russian and then became independent, then Soviet, then independent again. When Armenia was going to become independent again in 1990, 1991, there was a big debate on the role of genocide in what role should genocide play in Armenia's foreign policy, and particularly with regard to Turkey. This was a very, very fundamental debate. There were those who were saying Turkey is by definition <coughs> genocidal, Turks are criminals, they are born to kill Armenians, and Armenians are born to be victimized. So Armenia cannot be independent, it must be part of Russia. And others were saying, well, no, what happened was a historical experience, and um, uh, we have to remember, but genocide cannot be the basis of Armenia's foreign policy. Otherwise, you, are in, uh, in, you will be unable to have independence, and you will be unable to deal with your neighbors. And if Armenia is going to be a state, then it must deal with its neighbors. And you cannot deal with it if you have the first kind of policy. And that uh, played itself out. Uh, I don't want to go into too much detail, but the first administration under which I served went with the uh, historical interpretation and saying we need to deal with our neighbors. And it also matters what we say and do as to what Turkey says and does. Uh, that has now more or less on the way to being lost. Armenia is more or less reverting to that other but it's very important to see the role of, and this is what I'm talking at my paper at the conference at UCLA uh, tomorrow, Saturday, uh, the role of genocide in today's thinking in governments, and that is quite, quite important. My question is a bit theoretical and it's driven um, by, by a personal interest both as an individual and as an academic. I'm a diaspora Armenian and my scholarship also focuses on diaspora Armenian literature. Um, Professor Libaridian, in your, in your uh, segment, you use the word resolving at some point in saying resolving the problem the problem of what happened in history. Um, if we look beyond history um, and consider um, things like trauma in, in surviving generations, consider narratives and questions of representation in narratives and literature, if we consider the question of Western Armenian, um, the language of Ottoman Armenians now um, in exile, um, we, we may encounter um, the lack of any kind of closure um, and the very sort of understanding of the trauma or catastrophe of genocide um, may be defined in this, this lack of resolve, in fact, or lack of closure. So I'm wondering if you guys can, can share a little bit uh, um, about how you approach this, this uh, concept of resolution um, when you're talking about moving beyond, moving forward. Should I go first? Well. Um, Resolution uh, is a very uh, important term, 
as you point out, uh, I think there is no closure because closure necessitates acknowledgement by the perpetrator. And that is at least what I am focused on because that is something I can do something about. And I think what comes after closure, what is also our responsibility, both as uh, Turkish citizens and as uh, you know, human beings, is to then work to see what we can do uh, to, to sustain and continue that healing process, at least to contribute to it positively. That is all I can do, and what at least I am able to do uh, is that at Michigan, uh, I work with both Turkish and Armenian students, uh, where you know we are hoping and they are, they now think it, we say there was a time when Turks and Armenians couldn't talk to each other. They're saying, no, you know, how could that be? Because it's so different now. Uh, and hopefully they will build together a, a body of knowledge, uh, a, a common culture that also recognizes uh, and helps heal uh, the past, at least for the future generation. Of course, generations, the, the, those wounds will never go away. They will always be there. But at least people will be able to live with them and, and know that you know, there are others, especially the descendants of the perpetrators, that are willing uh, to work uh, on them, with them. So that is what I uh, imagine uh, resolution means to me. Yeah. That's a very difficult question, Talar. <laughs> um, uh, I mean, there's a simple answer which I gave when, when I was there. And I said, this thing will not be resolved yeah. <laughs> in general, because it is too complex, it's too deep. Uh, now, there's, there's parts of it that can be resolved. For example, if the Turkish government says, yes, this was. Uh, or the Tish Turkish government may say, oh, we're also providing uh, some funds. Uh, in fact, uh, President Erdogan made a statement, uh, which was a strange one. I don't know if you saw that. And he said, if we are found guilty, oh, of, we'll, yes. uh, we will pay the price. Now, I, no I don't know what he thought was the price, <laughs> but for example, with regard to the uh, language issue, Western Armenian being uh, lost or having been exiled, um, uh, it may make a difference. I think there are some efforts now to uh, help preserve the language and the literature, but there are two factors here. One is uh, that it's life. That is, uh, we live in other countries, we have to survive in other countries, and, and uh, it becomes very difficult even in a place like Los Angeles, which uh, uh, I don't know if Long Beach, uh, uh, Beach residents feel themselves part of Los Angeles. No, no, okay. Uh, but, uh, but even in a place like Los Angeles with, I don't know, over a dozen Armenian day schools and whatever, uh, kids, uh, you know, at the end end up speaking Turkish. Uh, uh, Turkish. <laughs> <laughs> French. Yeah, uh, uh, English. And in France, it's French and whatever. So, uh, so that, that's going to happen. Uh, and there are things we will, may never be able to recover regardless. That's, that language is, uh, is uh, one. Uh, and even in the Middle East, where we have stronger communities because the states are... Uh, organized such that you are defined by your religion and ethnicity. Uh, even there, I don't know if the graduates of the best schools of Lebanon today, or uh, I, I don't know what's left, Cyprus is gone, uh, mm -hmm. uh, can write Western Armenian without a mistake. How many of them can? How many Armenians who think they know Western Armenian have a uh, uh, have a vocabulary that's over 400 words, right? And uh, how, probably half of it is Turkish anyway. <laughs> uh, now, the other question, though, with regard to this is uh, a corollary of, uh, again, something I mentioned. That is, um, we have a certain kind of organization in our communities. Over the years, we have prioritized, and by and large, we have reproduced what we think we had under the Ottoman system. Church, party, school, newspaper, right? And uh, 
All of our efforts have gone into that. that these are decisions we have made. We have not been self-critical. And we have not taken yet responsibility for the decisions we took in the 20s, 30s, 40s, 50s on how to be organized. And this is not just a matter of relations between the Turkish state and the Armenian diaspora. It is a matter of the Armenian diaspora talking to itself and taking responsibility for things that it could have done that it didn't do. And for the way it did things that maybe it should have done but um, uh, look at, uh, for example, in the 1930s in this country, we don't feel it so much uh, now, and certainly didn't feel it so much on the West Coast even then, but uh, on, in the Midwest and in, on the East Coast, the uh, division of the church and the assassination of a bishop by some Armenians caused such a split that maybe 10, 20% of the young Armenians left the community. Because they said, this is crazy. If this is being Armenian, to hate each other, not to allow my daughter to marry another because he belongs to another church, another party, right? Uh, all of that are things that we did. The civil war in Lebanon in 58, uh, when I was a 13-year-old kid and I could see Armenians shooting Armenians, and I used to take sandwiches and water to one of some of these fighters who were killing other Armenians. When are we going to take responsibility for all of that? Not everything is a consequence of the genocide. And even if they are, then we should have been self-critical enough to realize what we're doing is a consequence of a trauma. And, and then work on ourselves in order to get out of that trauma, even though there's no justice yet. Even though there's no recognition yet. We cannot hide behind that all the time. Yeah. Uh, I'm really sorry for all the, uh, the uh, suffering and the loss of life that Armenians encountered after 1915. Uh, but there, right now, there's about 60 or 70,000 Arme illegal Armenians living in Turkey because they need to work. And nobody touches them. Everybody knows the government is aware of it. but. That is. So there's no violence against Armenians. That's uh, not true. <laughs> First. What someone asked uh, and you answered, why uh, or is there a reconciliation? Will the Turkish government accept something? As long as the Armenian constitution says that we own that part of uh, Turkey, how can the Turkish government say yes? That's yeah. not true either. That's in the Armenian Constitution. No, no, no, no. No, I, it's not. I wrote that constitution. It's not in there. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry. Several years ago, Turkey said, in order to move Armenians ahead, they have to say yes to the commission to bring about the history. Let's form, bring together the historians from both sides, and let's find out what happened. History is socially constructed. I would very much like you to identify. It's not I, I, why, what's your name? I would like to you to actually tell me who you are, please. I because you are. Yes, please do do tell you. No, not the reality as you define it. You are here to ask a question. If you want to ask a question, you have to ask the question. You cannot make public statements. This is a question that we are going to, no, this is a forum in which we are going to talk. You are not going to talk with us. No, I do not want to hear what you have to say. Uh, no, that is not what we are sir, here. I think sir, you should stop. Sir, please uh, sit down. Sir, we are not here to discuss the facts. But, yeah, okay? no, this we is We are not, not here to discuss, is, I said this it is at a the forum. beginning. No, no, okay. you cannot know the facts you, better than You want than to give a know. lecture, organize another one, yes, please. Yes, please, please sit down. You cannot talk about this. No, it not is not what we are here. Well, it is not one you should be attending, obviously. Please sit down. Please sit down. You cannot do this. I have a question. Your statement of 
was involved in this. Well, there's a chair there. Uh, the chair. Thank you very much. Professor Moore, can you please ask yes, a question? My name is please. Professor Moore. I teach here, and I'm interested in the question of the possible complicity of the United States government in the silence after World War II regarding the genocide. After all, the Cold War was taking place. Turkey was a close ally of the United States. Radar stations were placed in Turkey in order to monitor uh, USSR activities. Um, was there any arrangement made in which perhaps the United States is complicit in the silence regarding this genocide? Um, because after all, Turkey must have had, Turkey's government must have known um, there might be, might be possible consequences. And you also mentioned 1942. Yeah. I wasn't aware of that. Could you fill me in on details and what yeah, appears to have happened in 1942? 1942? Thank For, you. 42 terrorists, I think. 48. Oh, 40. 42? Uh, 42, I didn't mention. Well, I thought I heard one of you say that possibly in 1942 there was continued 20, repression of the, 20, I think oh, 22, 23, I was yeah. saying. Yeah. Oh, well, with, yeah, with, with regard to the United States, it's, it's a long story. It begins uh, soon after the uh, genocide itself uh, with uh, the U.S. Representative Bristol, who tries to change the impression that Turkey had left, uh, the Ottoman Empire had left with regard to the genocide. And you need to speak louder. Yeah. Okay. <clears throat> The United States, uh, the first major international humanitarian effort that the United States organized was with regard to uh, the victims of violence during the World War I in the Near East, but mostly, mostly Armenians, but not only, Greeks, Assyrians, etc. The Near East Relief yeah. uh, provided huge assistance, and it was a monumental effort and people-based effort. So the United States was very much aware. And the US representative, Ambassador Morgenthau was there during the worst part of, of the events. And he wrote his memoirs. And he went and talked to the Turkish leaders at the time and to no avail. Now, so uh, then 1920s, it started changing. The big change came after Turkey became a member of NATO. Yeah. That's what I'm talking about. Right. The, yeah. Then uh, a number of things happened. And since then, the argument is, um, begins with that security agreement. That is, since Turkey is an ally, then we cannot say things that may, uh, in, in fact, uh, be a problem for Turkey. And uh, State Department and other statements that deny the genocide don't do so on the facts. They do so on the fact that Turkey is a friend. Mm -hmm. So that has continued. So your characterization as complicity is there. Uh, it, it has been there for some time. <coughs> Various candidates for the presidency have said they would recognize. Mm -hmm. President Obama said so that it was genocide. Then uh, he used the term Medziren, which is the great catastrophe, uh, the term Armenians used to use before 48. Uh, but he also said he hasn't changed his mind. While president, he didn't use the term genocide. But he said he hasn't changed his mind. So <coughs> by and large, though, the State Department, uh, oil companies, uh, the military, there are major institutions that have vested interest in Turkey. And they try to help Turkey in this issue in Washington. And, and if I may <coughs> add also, uh, Actually, uh, what happens uh, is that uh, for this uh, denial of violence book, uh, I, I uh, used 350 memoirs, contemporaneous memoirs. And if you look at uh, Turkish history, starting with uh, the 1911-12 war uh, in Tripoli, uh, in Libya, then there is the Balkan Wars, 1912-1913, uh, First World War, 1914-18, Independence War, 1919 to 22. So basically, uh, the, the military is there. The fighting goes on for 10 years straight. And after the foundation of the Republic, then you go into the Second World War, which Turkey didn't participate in, but was nevertheless there. And at the end of the Second World War, then, of course, because of the Cold War, Turkey joins uh, you know, um, the US uh, camp, and that is very significant in terms of uh, 
the way in which uh, Turkish foreign policy is set, because it is set literally in accordance with uh, uh, where the Americans are standing. In one of the memoirs, one of the Turkish um, uh, you know, uh, ambassadors uh, um, said, uh, one of the Turkish representatives said that whenever there was a, um, a vote to be taken, the one thing they had to do was to find a seat from which they can see the U U.S. representatives because they would f vote exactly as the U.S. would vote. And that meant that they didn't have to do much else. So that also corroborates, in a way, what you're saying. Thank you. Thank you. We have two more questions. And you mentioned, um, like, re until recently, they didn't um, acknowledge it was genocide. I just want to know, I took world history when I was a sophomore and you know we learned about the Holocaust for quite some for a little bit not that long but the statement that kept coming up was never again you know because the more education you have you know obviously you can you know look at the past and hopefully not have it happen again but the point is how come do you think that they're not really I mean they're still acknowledging it but still a lot of people don't know about this genocide I mean, who is they who do you have in mind like in my public school like I didn't learn about their media genocide. Uh -huh. I learned about it because I, I'm of Russian descent I spoke about it with my father I learned about it that way how come a lot of people don't know about it? I mean, it's a sad thing that people aren't educated about it. They don't know what happened. They should know what's going on. And like this was in you know, the world to pass. Well, there's so much to know. There's so much to learn. Uh, uh, it's difficult to say how come people don't know about it. Armenians try to uh, uh, do projects, films, books, and uh, uh, it's very difficult to say why some people don't know about it. And, uh, you know, uh, uh, do you know about Biafra? Biafra, yeah, Biafra, yeah. Do you, you know, know about Biafra? Yeah, that's also very uh, that's, That was a genocide in the 70s no one talks about anymore. Yeah. That was in Nigeria, the south yeah. uh, east. Three major, there's a hundred tribes in Nigeria, but three major, Ibo, Yoruba, and Hausa Fulani. Mm. Ibo, Yoruba are Christian, Hausa Fulani are Muslims by and large. And the Igbos uh, wanted to separate from Nigeria, and uh, the cost was two million lives of the Igbo. And who remembers now? So it's it's. Uh, yeah. Oh, you do. Yes. Well, I think uh, if yeah. I may add to that, uh, once uh, of course, uh, in general, states and societies are very loath to uh, acknowledge the violence in their own pasts. Uh, because it is extremely difficult to come to terms with it. There are peop some people argue that uh, Germany would not have recognized, uh, acknowledged what they did had they not lost the war and had there not been such a, a concerted effort. And also many of the perpetrators were not actually uh, uh, punished uh, because uh, they were crucial uh, in the Cold War and therefore they got away with it. Uh, so in a way then, the tendency unfortunately t seems to be for uh, states uh, to focus much more on stability than change. And people argue that during the Cold War, especially uh, the United States, in terms of the countries with which it allied, always put stability uh, in front of democracy. And ra as a consequence, uh, you know, allowed these silences uh, to continue. But ever since the end of the Cold War, I think all countries, including the United States, is trying to come to terms uh, with the violence in their own pasts. So I would say probably there is also a tendency, because as a sociologist, I'm very interested in patterns of thought. And I think that is one pattern that seems to uh, be uh, changing. Grandmother used to tell me the story, same with my husband's grandmother, about the first genocide. Oral history, as Dr. Yubaridian very well knows, oral history. Mm -hmm. We had a lot of uh, recordings of people. Is the government dealing at all or even mentioning about the first genocide? Was that 1893? 1894 to 96. Those, uh, yes. Yeah, we don't call it, yeah, don't call it genocide. Course. In, uh, our grandmothers called it the Buick Katal, Buick Katal, big Buick massacre, Katal, big massacre, compared to smaller ones that had happened. Yeah. And so 1894-96 is the Buick Katal, the, the great, one or the small 
No, yeah. it's called the Büyük Kital. Although it was small compared to what would happen in 1915, it was big compared to what had happened before. So we, the question of applying the term genocide to that is, is uh, not agreed upon. That is, um, there are some scholars who will insist that when we talk about the Armenian Genocide, we should be talking fundamentally 1878, uh, after the Russian withdrawal, there were massacres of Armenians in the eastern provinces, but or 1894 to 1923. So there are those who say this was the, the whole period is genocide. Uh, some of us uh, will insist that uh, the term genocide is a very technical term, clearly defined, and as I mentioned earlier, there's the question of intentionality. Was the intention of the Ottoman government to exterminate Armenians in 1894-96? No. No, it was not. No, it, it was, was not. to punish. It was, well, I as a historian decided it was not, the purpose was not to exterminate the Armenian nation. Was? It was to punish the revolutionaries, to punish the support for revolutions, to decrease the numbers, to, uh, to, um, uh, to make sure reforms don't happen, etc. Those, that's a very different thing than what happened in 1915, where you have a planned, intentional, and the intention is to eliminate Armenians, to exterminate Armenians. That's a, that's a different thing. Yeah. And in the 1894 to 96, about 100 to 300,000 Armenians perished. And I agree that it was not intentional in the same way. Yes, yes, uh, it was. Uh, and then later on, uh, Actually, I do not, when I started working on, on, on this, I did not uh, call what happened a genocide. Not because it was not a genocide, but instead because uh, many people in, in Turkish society did not even know anything had happened, let alone uh, the, the degree of violence. And as a consequence, I, fer I thought that the first stage would be at least uh, to uh, write about what had happened so that the Turkish society would be aware and then we would come, together come uh, and call it what it was. But that resolve uh, ended uh, with the assassination of Hrant Dink who was a very close uh, friend of mine in 2007 and I said after that uh, I will call it what it is uh, and uh, uh, hopefully uh, Turkish society will learn and come to that eventually on their own. And that is why I changed, yeah. Okay. Okay, one more, and that's it. <laughs> what was the cause of this mass killing? What did it start it? Why did they start killing Armenians then? You're asking me? Yes, yes of course. What happens is, uh, when I write my, in my book, I start with 1789 to 2009. So I cover, two I mean, 210, 20 years. And for me, what was important, I didn't only want to focus on 1915 to 17 because, as you mentioned, there was collective violence against the Armenians before then. And then I said, well, if there is Arme uh, collective violence then, how far back can we go? To me, uh, I use actually the formulation of uh, Zygmunt Bauman and Hannah Arendt uh, and others uh, with respect to modernity. And modernity and its advent in, uh, into the Ottoman Empire, the systematic uh, modernization of the empire, starts in 1789 with the coming to the throne of Selim III. Uh, what happens after that is that um, there is a, a different sense. There is a slow shift from subjects to citizens. And uh, the relations within uh, and among uh, communities start getting polarized. And what happens is that before the Armenians were protected under communal uh, laws, then that shifts uh, and Armenians, like the rest of the subjects, become individuals. And once they become individual citizens, it is then the state's responsibility to protect each and every one. But in that context, what happens is that those they do not deem to be equal to others in spite of the reforms of 1839, 56, and 76, uh, are not protected as much. And then that is when there is a lot of uh, uh, 
there is a lot of violence that does not get punished. And once that becomes a pattern, then it becomes very hard to, to basically uh, reverse uh, things. And in 1894-96, even though it wasn't intentional, nevertheless, the, that, that's the first instance when the people who did uh, kill those uh, Armenians were not punished. So that is a very important precedent. Uh, that also continues in 1909 Adana massacres. There is an attempt to punish, but not all of them. Is it because of their religion? Uh, faith? faith? Well, it or is. Because they are smart people? <laughs> <laughs> or they are intellectual? I, I, no, that is. The I think uh, the reason is uh, because I would uh, argue is because of the way in which the millet system was, uh, was set that they were not fully integrated into Ottoman society. They lived under protection. And as a consequence, uh, they, I do not think they were able to develop as close ties with the rest of society, with Muslims, as they would. But another important thing is there is also a very significant divide within the Armenian community itself, especially the Bolis Armenians or those who lived in major cities like Istanbul uh, and Izmir, were able to accumulate a lot of wealth right. through their interaction with trade, especially, and banking, right. with Europe. But the Sultan tolerated that enrichment insofar as they, they remained apolitical. So that is why within, I mean, I talk about the divide within, because the Armenians in the eastern territories uh, uh, uh, I mean, Vilayet, the, the Vilayet, the provinces, uh, lost a lot of their land, uh, the land that they had had for generations, if not millennia. Uh, and the way they did was there was in 1858 a private property law that for the first time brought the practice of title deeds. A lot of these were, didn't have title deeds. This also corresponded 1850s to the times when Kurds, who had been nomadic, were settled. That, when you put that on top with the fact that the Muslims in the empire could carry guns, arms and armaments, and non-Muslims could not because they were product protected, there was a lot of injustice that happened in the East. And that is why you had the initial uh, ones, because the Armenians had tilled the land, were wealthy, but nevertheless, they weren't able to preserve their land. And they became much more revolutionary than the ones in Istanbul and you know, in Izmir and other places. And that is also another reason uh, why I think that is, you know, I would say it's just the way history developed over time. Uh, that, and this was happening also at a time when the empire was shrinking extremely rapidly. And there was a lot of land loss. So most of the Ottoman Muslims who, were, who held positions as officials and officers related to the state were becoming increasingly impoverished. And it is the, that's what I call the polarization that eventually led to the conflicts. Thank you. Yeah. Thank, you. Uh, thank you all for coming, uh, for your patience, and uh, I hope that it's been uh, our speakers and I'd like to plug the UCLA conference on genocide especially if you'd like to hear them uh, speak again on different subjects it is Friday and Saturday tomorrow and Saturday uh, and I can give you more information if you're interested thanks again for coming and thank you uh, our honored guests thank you thank you very much you're welcome there was at least one <laughs> well.